and security has always been a top concern for the board. We have been working on items over the years. Uh, for example, adding secure vestibules to all of the buildings has been something that took time. Uh, and I know that you know since the uh, shooting in, in um, Parkland in February, you know everyone has heightened concerns. And so you know the board and the administration has you know heard from the community, heard what people are saying, you know, um, and wanting to know what's happening. What are we doing? Now, what have we done? What are we What are we planning to do? So that's what this night is for, to uh, present what the district has done, what the district has in place, to say what we've done since February, hearing you know, people's concerns from the uh, parents and from the community, and to, and to share what we plan to do going forward. So thank you again for coming, and I hope you find the the night informational and useful and. Hopefully you get questions answered, and if not, that there's a, a you know way for you to, to ask your questions and, and share information with the district so that we can continue to uh, work together and move forward and make our schools as safe as possible for our children. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Yardley. So this slide up here, I think, sums it up very well. Basically, whenever we think of school safety, district safety, we have to think of it as a joint responsibility where everyone works together. So you will see tonight a lot of representatives here who are helping us as we continue to try to improve our efforts. You met Mrs. Yardley, our board president. I'd like to introduce a couple of our other school board members who are here. And whenever I call someone's name, I'm going to ask them to stand and turn because we are videotaping this program so that if parents and others could not be here tonight, they will be able to watch it. It will be accessible through our website. So we thank Mr. Joe Ferry for that. Uh, we have with us tonight Mrs. Joan Cohen, Mr. Bill Krauss. They are two of our other board members. We also have some of our district administrators here who work closely with us on safety efforts. Mr. Jeff Loffler, our director of facilities. Turn the, <laughs> turn the volume up for the microphone. Ms. Gina DeBona is our high school principal. I see Mr. Howard Vogel back there, one of our elementary principals from Grass, so we thank them for being here tonight. I must say we have a terrific relationship with our local police departments, and that is evident by their presence here tonight. I'd like to introduce you to Chief Rod Blake from the Penridge Regional Police. Chief Christopher Engelhart from Hilltown Township, and Sergeant Alex Sprouse from Purposely Borough. We also have with us tonight one of our legislators, Mr. Sean O'Connor from Kathy, Kathy Watson's office. So again, this is a whole group effort, everyone working together. So PASA is an organization that stands for Pennsylvania Association of School Administrators. And basically, they provide administrators across the state with suggestions all the time on a variety of different topics. So after the event that happened in Parkland, as Mrs. Yardley said, they then sent out to all administrators some suggestions of things that they felt that we across the state should be doing. And as we looked at this list, I have to say we felt pretty good about the fact that we feel as though if we are doing these, we're in process of doing them. So they're listed up here. Every threat that we receive, we do take seriously. And we report that immediately to our local police department. We are at a point now where we are looking at security and safety plans again for all of our schools. You're going to hear a little bit later about these tabletop exercises that we practice along with our ALICE security program. We always do lockdowns, evacuations, intruder drills, and many times our local police departments are here with us and they give us feedback and we debrief and say what could we do better the next time. We are in the midst of reviewing and updating our safety plans, looking at each school individually, because each of them has a different layout, so therefore we have to do things a little bit differently. 
A couple years ago, we hired an outside company that came in and did a safety audit for us. They then came back again after we placed things into position, and then they said, okay, that looks good, or did you think about that? So we continue to do that with people who are experts in the field. We always meet with our local police officers. I would say it's about every other month, myself, Dr. Price, and Dr. Wyorka. And we go over different things that are happening in the community, not just having to do necessarily with safety, but just different things we want to update each other on. Patterns we're seeing in the schools and patterns they're seeing in the community. And we are in the midst of looking at our district policies and seeing if any of them need to be updated regarding school safety. So at this point, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Sherry Wyorka. She is our new Director of Pupil Services. Thank you, Dr. Radigan. When we were planning um, this presentation tonight, we really wanted to make sure that we talked about the two kinds of safety that we're talking about for our students. So you're going to hear a lot tonight after I finish here about physical safety. You're going to hear about ALICE. You're going to hear about our all hazards plan. <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on right now is the emotional safety of our students. So there are a number of supports that we've put in place to address the issues of emotional safety. So one of the things that we have in place are crisis counselors. We um, have a contract with Lakeside, and we have two crisis counselors that are district-wide that can respond to any student that is in crisis. It could be suicide assessment that they're doing with students, there could be drug and alcohol issues, or there could be other presenting issues such as anxiety, depression, self-harm, anger management, those kind of things. And then in addition to the two crisis counselors, we also have four additional counselors through Lakeside that are providing support to students and they're doing individual therapy or group therapy and talking about these same issues. The second um, bullet up here is our Student Assistance Program, or SAP, is the way what we refer to it as. So we have SAP teams in place at the middle school and the high school currently. All um, SAP members have received specialized training, and they can respond and assist students who are referred for any number of things. It could be behavior concerns, again, drug and alcohol issues, mental health issues. Um, it's not a disciplinary, um, it's not disciplinary in any way. It's put in place to help students, to talk with students about the issues that they might be dealing with, and then to pull some supports around them. Referrals can come from peers, from other students, from parents, or from school team members. We also have, um, we've conducted training for the elementary principals, so we'll be looking to roll out SAP teams at all the elementary school buildings as well. The next item is MTSS. This is a multi-tiered system of support. We are currently piloting this at two of the elementary schools, Sellersville and Siler. And this really looks at the whole student. So if we have a student that is struggling academically, that's sort of where it starts, and they come to this team, it's a school team, and they review data on the student. It can be academic data, um, but it, they look at the whole child. So they reach out to the family and find out, are there any, any mental health issues that the child might be dealing with um, and, and other issues that would come to that team and then put supports in place at the building level for that student. The next item is our Family Foundations Partnership. And this is a student support program at the high school. And it's, this program is designed to help keep our students in school when they're struggling with issues. So Family Foundations, again, it's, they come in, um, they're a community agency that comes into the school and they'll provide counseling for students, either individual or group counseling. Um, and it, again, it includes issues such as drug and alcohol use, life skills, anger management, um, those kind of things. They work with parents and families to make sure that we include um, family planning and support to the families. They can go out after school and do home visits if that's requested. Um, and then they have mentors from the local community that come into the high school and talk with students. They, we might have speaking engagements and volunteers that help to guide students. 
So that is our Family Foundations partnership. And then we have a, a very large social emotional learning focus here at Penridge. Social emotional learning um, is helping students to recognize and manage their emotions. We want them to learn to care about and respect others and develop positive relationships and make good decisions and behave responsibly and ethically. So that's sort of our overarching theme of social emotional learning. Um, there is a theme of the month, every month, um, <clears throat> and that's our Takes Pride theme. So if you go on the district website, you can learn more about the social emotional learning program that we have in place. We also have a pretty um, hefty curriculum for social emotional learning at the elementary school. So there are lessons designed on trustworthiness, acceptance, kindness, empathy, perseverance, service lessons, um, respect, and initiative, and dependability. So we have a pretty intensive curriculum at the elementary school, um, additional lessons on dependability, esteem building, and then lots of resources to, for, to support our teachers in delivering that curriculum at the elementary school. And then the final um, thing that I wanted to talk about are the anti-bullying efforts. There are so many resources on the website. If you go on the website and just um, put in the search bullying, um, you will see all of the activities that have been happening in the district. And then if you go to each individual school, you'll see some of the, the things that they're doing building specific to address anti-bullying. So we've had school assemblies, we've had anti-bullying themes and signs and posters in the schools, education lessons in the classroom, we have school-wide positive behavior programs in place, monthly themes and lessons, and then um, again online you can see it's sort of broken down by each um, level. So at the high school they do things like um, they have anonymous ways that students can report bullying, um, email to counselors that is anonymous and confidential, there's a Penridge hotline where they can call and leave, anybody can call and leave anonymous information. They have grade level meetings and there's a bullying packet. Um, and then they also have a peer conflict resolution process with the guidance counselors when we know about bullying. At the middle school, they have counseling groups as well. They have a guidance curriculum in place in each of the grade levels <clears throat> in the middle school as well. And then in the elementary school, um, they have a curriculum in place in, their, in health um, in grades one to five. And that focuses on numerous issues related to bullying. So positive interactions and reporting concerns when you have them. In grade two, how to talk to parents about something that's bothering you, how to say no to a bully. In grade th three, defining and resolving conflict. Grade four, personal strengths and weaknesses, how to belong to a group and healthy group behaviors. And grade five focuses on harassment, um, bullying, physical and verbal. Um, they do some role playing in that grade um, and they have some writing prompts that they respond to. So um, pretty intensive efforts in the district related to anti-bullying, um, but the, big, the most important thing is that we need to know about it. So if you know about it, or if you're a parent, we need it to be reported to us, and then we investigate every report that's made, um, and then we handle it accordingly. So those are um, the emotional safety supports that we have in place in the district. And next, I will turn this over to Ms. Jacqueline McHale, Director of Human Resources. Thank you, Dr. Orga. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Raptor system. And the Raptor system is for visitors that are entering our building and or um, vendors who might be coming in. So the Raptor system was voted by the school board, was implemented and voted in by the school board in January of 2016, and soon thereafter was put into place. Um, some of the highlights of the Raptor system, you can electrically sign in and out visitors by swiping a license. They provide visitor badges to all those who are in the building. It gives you real-time 
sex offender alerts, and it will screen all your visitors coming through again for your through the National Sex Offender Database through all 50 states. So a little bit about Rapture. It's a web-based um, software visitor management system. Again, has the ability to scan, scan a driver's license and or another government photo ID. The information from the ID is then compared to the database, again, throughout the 50 states um, that consists of all your registered sex offenders. The Raptor system then prints a badge for the visitor that includes the photo, the name of the visitor, and the date and time and the destination of their locate where they're going to. So when the visitor arrives to one of our school buildings, and these are in all of our um, school buildings as well as our district administration office, there are stations, they'll be greeted at the reception desk by the secretary. Um, that staff member will then scan again either a government ID or a license, most times it's a license. If they do not have an acceptable photo ID, they could always um, put in their um, name, date of birth, and their address, and that again will scan through the system and provide the information whether or not that person has what we call a hit. So a visitor, again, coming in always needs to provide this. If they're just coming into the main office, and I think we had this question at the board meeting, if they're just coming into the main office to drop off lunch or, or something that you know a student has missed um, taking to school with them, then they don't scan them in. But if someone's actually going into the building, they do have to scan in and obtain a visitor's badge through the, through the um, system. So the badge is worn at all times while the visitor is in the district in that building, and then when they're leaving, they have to report back to the main office and return the badge. In addition to visitors, all the vendors, as I said, and contractors are also scanned through the system when they come into the building. So, you know, that's, that's important to us. That it just prevents people from, you know, coming into the building, not being identified. You don't know who's walking around. Um, this way, everyone coming through is identified, and they're scanned through this database. So I also wanted to talk about field trips. There's been a lot of conversation about having badges for people um, that are attending field trips, parents, grandparents, whoever, um, or coming in the building to work as volunteers in the classroom. So the, the system has the capability to print out batches of, of volunteer um, badges to be worn the day of the field trip. We ask that the teachers provide us with a list, well, provide the building secretary with a list of approved chaperones. Those chaperones are all run through our volunteer system. They all provide us with three clearances and a TV test current within 90 days in accordance with the school code. So once they approve, they provide that list to the building secretary. The building secretary will go through, match it up with our approved volunteer list. If they're approved volunteers, he or she will then go in and they'll print out the badges. And I brought a sample for you to see. She's going to be so happy I'm doing this to her. This is our receptionist at the district administration office, Tiffany. So, so the badge will look like that. And again, it will have Tiffany's name on there, her picture, and it will identify her as a volunteer. And we ask that all of our chaperones wear these throughout um, the entire day while they're chaperoning on a field trip or again in the building as a visitor helping in a classroom. So in addition to that, um, Raptor occasionally has an advancement to their technology. We do scan all of that. We, we review the new technology to see if it's something that we want to put into place. Um, they had something that came out a couple months ago that we're currently taking a look at to see if that would be something that would help us. But again, just to you know, kind of wrap up, the main thing is that all visitors coming in are scanned. They're identified as being cleared from the child abuse offender website and database throughout the entire United States and they are identified then as a visitor or an approved volunteer for a field trip. So, um, yeah, so that's all I have on, on Raptor. And again, we'll, we'll keep checking out their updates as they're provided to us. And um, if we think it's something that we can implement, we'll certainly take a look at that. Um,
Okay, so the next person up is our security officer at the high school, Mr. Dan Branch. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dan Branch. I'm one of the four security guards here at Penridge High School. Mr. Donald Fry over in the corner, one of the co-workers, Mr. Keith Clark, that just steps outside. And I believe you saw Mr. Harry Hall as you came in. He was sitting at the front security desk. Um, we're, I'm going to do a quick overview of Alice. In a moment's decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next thing is the wrong thing. The worst thing you can do is nothing at all. The benefits of Alice create situational awareness with human, with human actions, provides a plan of action to increase the chances of survival, increases confidence, and reduces fear. This vastly diminishes the odds of the success of the intruder. The acronym of for, for ALICE is ALERT, LOCKDOWN, INFORM, COUNTER, AND EVACUATE. Which leads me into uh, Director of Administrations, Dr. Price. Okay. Okay, I'll give you a quick alert um, through the high school through all the schools if there is an intruder there somebody will get on the pa system at the high school level we are fortunate that our portables and i believe they're at all the levels that they can get on the portable and go over the pa system to alert if there's an intruder okay that would be our alert first alert to the students and staff that there's an intruder into the building um then the they would go into a lockdown mode, which basically is they're listening, listening for instructions, and prepare to make a decision. We inform. We would give the best detailed location for the intruder, where the intruder's at. If you're here at the high school, if the intruder's on the third floor. You have the first and second floor. We would want to get those students out as quick as possible. Counter. God forbid if it, uh, someone gets into a classroom, the intruder gets in the classroom. This could be a student that ha already has something in their backpack, pulls out a knife or any type of weapon that the students will counter that, throwing textbooks, computers, whatever they have to do to protect themselves. The best option is evacuate everybody out of the building. Is to get away from the building and get away from the hazard as quick as they possibly can. Okay, now I'll introduce Dr. Uh, Troy Price, Director of Administration. Good evening, everybody. The last thing I would say about Alice is that this is not a sequential um, intruder system. And what I mean by that is these things don't happen in this order and in most real life situations probably wouldn't happen in this order. So as Dan ended by saying the best option is to evacuate, so we want to get as many students to safety as we possibly can. And that is the difference between Alice and some of the older systems of locking down and, and hiding in place. Uh, the countering that he mentioned, you know, we're not teaching, and this is something that we hear and get questions about, we're not teaching students to, to fight back. So if they see an intruder in the hallway, they're not leaving the classroom and attacking a, an intruder. It's used as a last resort if someone's faced with that ultimate situation of life and death. What would you do in that situation? You're not going to hide on your desk anymore. You're going to do whatever you can to um, try to distract someone that may bring harm to you. So that's a, a, a moment of last resort. And so I guess the last thing I wanted to say here is this is, this is not sequential. And at all levels, that's taught differently. Uh, teaching that lesson and, and practicing that with an elementary student looks far different than with a high school student. So I wanted to talk about, Dan told you what Alice was. Now I want to talk a little bit about what this looks like when we practice Alice in our schools. So currently, uh, we are doing, we are requiring two drills per year of an active intruder nature. 
Last year was the first year we implemented Alice, so we required one to get things rolling. This year we were more detailed with the drills, and we required one in the fall and also one in the spring. We also do our fire drills, our emergency weather drills, and so forth. So we're doing lots of drills and interrupting the schedule a lot, but always for important reasons. And we know it can become frustrating, but we want to make that time worthwhile. And when we conduct it, we'll get it over as quick as possible, but we want it to be meaningful for everyone. So this is a two-part drill, Alice, and this is the same at all levels. Um, what we mean by a tabletop drill is students will talk about, they'll discuss around a table, around the classroom, exactly what they would do in a specific situation. And then they'll practice this and it'll be a live drill. So, so I'll give you an example. And some schools do this the same day. They'll do a tabletop drill, a teacher will have a discussion with students, and then they'll practice the live drill. Others will do one on one day and the next day do the live drill. So for example, I might say to my class, we're gonna practice now and talk about a situation where we have an intruder that just entered the main office and they're heading down a specific hallway past the gymnasium, you know, per se. And now the whole entire school is discussing that scenario because the principal just made that announcement over the PA system. They've announced that it's a drill and that you're gonna have a discussion. And then that classroom writes down on a piece of paper what they decided as a class would be the best option under those circumstances. And then there are monitors that are helping the principal during that drill, and they go around from classroom to classroom and they collect those slips of paper. And then the principal and the administration can follow up, um, especially if they don't agree with the action they took. But in most cases, there's either a very clear-cut answer because the intruder may, build, may be in the far end of the building or on a completely different floor, or it's a situation where the, it's gonna be the comfort level, and if you're unsure, there probably is not a wrong answer in that situation. The options the students and the teacher has to discuss are really twofold. Are we getting out or are we gonna barricade the door? And the barricading is also different than years back because we're not just, again, locking the door, hiding in place, but they're locking the door, securing the door, and, and if there's time, possibly with furniture, possibly moving a bookcase or filing cabinets. And again, that looks a little different based on age and strength. And so our teachers and our staff have really taken time to look at what's in their classroom and what could be used in a moment of emergency like this. And we've seen them relocate things and ask custodians and security officers to assess their classroom. And if they really had to move something in a matter of seconds, would there be something they can move in front of a door? Now that's not as easy as it sounds because we have doors that swing in, we have doors that swing out. We have all sorts of classroom arrangements. We have lots of glass, as you see when you come into the high school. It's like that in, in all of our buildings. So they're, they're also uh, looking at how do I cover the glass maybe next to the door? So lots of discussions during that tabletop drill. And they're getting quicker and quicker at doing that piece of it. And then the live drill, they'll get a different scenario. So this may be right after that discussion or maybe the next day. And now they're giving a different scenario. But this time they're told, we want you to actually react to it. So they're going to be an announcement that comes across the PA system. And the intruder's at a certain area of the building. And maybe heading you know, down a specific corridor past a certain room. If I'm a substitute teacher in there, I may not even know exactly where that is. I may be the first time I subbed in the district, and I'm not going to have time to go look at a building map. So a decision's going to have to be made pretty quickly, and so they know to, our staff knows to err on the side of caution and lock down if they're not absolutely sure they can get the children out. So during this live drill, there'll be students exiting the building, there'll be students that are locking down and barricading the doors. One of the other things that's an important piece of this is and Dan said it, is the alert piece, we need to share information throughout a situation like this. So our principals have access to the PA system on their walkie-talkies as well as the telephones. Our teachers have access to the PA system in their classrooms when they punch a code in. So sharing information during a tragic situation is important because I may have decided to lock down and now that intruder has moved to a different area of the building and now I'm sure I can get out. So now we're unbarricading and the kids are getting out. The reality is in a situation like this, no one wants to face, it's tough to make some of those decisions, especially to get out, especially when you're responsible for lots of children's safety. So we think that in a real life situation, many will barricade that maybe could have gotten out, but the more we practice these drills, we hope that they have the confidence to make that decision and know that they have the support to get out. So 
the decision they make, you know, the fifth time we do this drill may be different than they would have made the first time because they're more confident with doing this. So that's why we're practicing as well. It's not just to um, get used to doing it in different classrooms because we think that being in different classrooms, yeah, there's different furniture in there, but the concept is the same. But I think ultimately it's having that confidence and, and feeling that you are empowered to make good decisions and not just hide anymore. So that's a little bit about what those drills look like. Next thing, we're going to go into some, some frequently asked questions. And I wanted to start by saying, um, after some of the tragic situations that recently happened, particularly the Florida shooting, we knew that there was lots of questions about what we do in the district buildings, and not just in the buildings, but also on campus. So we're real, real conscious to talk about campus safety and not just building safety. And the reality is that there's, there's more children that are killed um, by cars and automobiles and buses than there are in school shootings. So we have to look at the entire campus. An example of that is last year our high school looked at their traffic patterns on campus here, parent pickup, drop off, et cetera, and, and really changed that procedure um, with school safety in mind. So we're always looking at the entire campus safety. So in March, we sent out the link to post questions or comments regarding um, school procedures as it uh, pertains to school safety. We received about 66 responses. Uh, most were questions, a couple were comments, but there were a lot of repetitive themes. So what we did is, we knew we couldn't possibly put every one of those questions up here and answer them for you tonight. We took the five biggest themes, and that's the ones we're gonna start with and answer for you. If you did submit a question, and we don't answer that tonight, or it wasn't answered in the presentation, we do have some comment cards up here and some pens that you're welcome, if you want a response back directly, to fill one of those out and leave it with us and we'll get back to you personally with an answer to your question. And at the end, if we have time here tonight, we will also field some questions as it pertains to the presentation. So the first question, the first theme, was in regard to metal detectors. And is the district going to consider buying metal detectors? So when there's a, a tragic event, there really is the feeling that there needs to be an imminent response and that change has to be made. And our experts tell us that they don't want us to make knee-jerk reactions. And a few of us, including Mr. Branch recently, and, and Mr. Fry as well, recently attended a safe school symposium. And we heard some experts in the field. We heard from school psychologists, we heard from an advisor to Homeland Security. Um, and, and they really talked a great deal about don't fall down the path of knee-jerk reactions. Besides some of the practical implications of metal detectors, costs and personnel and so forth, there's also the human side. There's the side that someone can open a door and let a friend in or let an adult in that's not covered by a metal detector or by staff. So they're not without flaw, I guess is the point to that. But the recommendation really is to spend the money elsewhere. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But let me tie in the next question before I do that. The next one was about bulletproof glass. And now companies are marketing bulletproof backpacks to students. So the recommendation is the same here from our experts. And our security experts are saying, you don't need to purchase bulletproof glass. We believe that as well. And in fact, part of our Alice protocol teaches staff how to break glass properly and get out when there's a fire or when there is an emergency situation, you have to evacuate through glass. That would be difficult to do if it was bulletproof or if there was chicken wire embedded in it and so forth. So for that reason as well, we don't think this is a great idea. But what we are being told to spend our money on is really the prevention side. And spending money on identifying warning signs and being able to conduct proper and thorough threat assessments even drilling down to the teacher level of training staff of how to read compositions and look at uh, a student who maybe wrote in the voice of a character from a Shakespeare piece. And you know, they claim that that violent writing was because they were writing in, you know, in the voice of that character. Well, there's red flags that can be recognized. And in many of the tragic events that happened around the country, there were red flags that were missed, as you've read in the news and as you know. 
And some of those situations, there were multiple red flags. So we really want to put our attention, our time, our money, our focus on training all staff and students to recognize signs. And I say students as well, because there were situations where students um, knew that other uh, fellow students purchased weapons and uh, did not report it because they came maybe from a good family or they knew they went target shooting with their, with their father. And so we want students as well as staff to, to play a part of this team at Penridge and be able to recognize warning signs and for us to be able to conduct a threat assessment as necessary and for those threat assessments to be ongoing and not one-time assessments of a student's ability to continue on in the school uh, without help. So that's where we, we really hope to focus our, our attention and our money. Now, there's a couple more questions here. We have three more FAQs. And I'm going to share the wealth here with everyone. Okay, so another popular theme from the questions was, will you consider allowing teachers to participate in training and to begin carrying a gun? And what we've learned um, about this is it, it, this is a popular suggestion both locally here and throughout the country. Um, and the reasoning is that you know people feel that if someone is intent on causing harm, they would be less likely to attack a location where they know that employees are armed and that the response would be quicker in the event of an incident. Um, there has been proposed legislation that passed in the Senate in June of 2017 but this, the public school code has not been amended. Um, so there is nothing in public school code that allows us to do this right now. If it were legal um, for school staff to carry a firearm, the primary consideration would be training of those employees, um, liability and security of the weapon when it was on school property. We talked with law enforcement um, and there's concern about um, if you know, how would they distinguish a teacher who's carrying a firearm versus the intruder when they're coming to respond to an emergency? So that's a major concern. And then also there's the concern about the weapon falling into the wrong hands during a regular school day. Um, and then also would a teacher um, really be capable of using a weapon against a student that might have been one of their students? That's something to think about as well. And then finally, there's a lot of intensive um, psychological screening and firearms training that's associated with law enforcement carrying a gun. So that would be difficult for us to duplicate for teachers. So those are some of the considerations when you look at that question. Before I get to um, answering this question, I just wanted to circle back to the ALICE drills. Dr. Price had mentioned substitutes um, coming into the classroom, being unfamiliar with that classroom. I just wanted to um, let you all know that Palisades, Quakertown, and Penridge partnered last year with our vendor, Source for Teachers, to provide training um, through law enforcement um, with the ALICE training for any substitute that would come to the training. And um, we did that on an in-service day so that we weren't losing, you know, the substitute coverage. And we had, I believe, our initial turnout was close to 70, I want to say, and we're hoping to do that annually. So we're going to open that up, you know, as a team, you know, partnering with these other schools to any, any one that's interested in doing that, and we provided them with some snacks, and Quakertown hosted last year, so it was a win-win for everybody, so that when they're coming into any of our schools, they know the ALICE procedures. Okay. So my question um, that I'm answering is about the armed security officers versus a school resource officer, and currently there's two options that are being considered. Uh, the first would be to hire additional unarmed security officers. Right now we have three security officers who were introduced earlier, and the board has approved several substitute officers to work part-time either in the evenings to cover events or to 
cover um, the shifts of the gentlemen who are full-time officers. So we are looking at even additional full-time officers in that regard, again, they're unarmed. The other option would be to hire a school resource officer, school resource officer, or SRO, as you hear it out there in the community so often, is an armed officer, and um, that individual would be initially placed at the high school. So right now, those are the two things we're looking at. Um, what we have done, again, three security officers, and the approval of, of the part-time substitute officers. Thank you. One of the things I will add along those lines is the advantage of having some more security officers. We can have folks at the doors in the morning and in the afternoon when people are coming and going. I know here at the high school they probably have, is it about 40 or 50 doors? where people could come and go. So what we've done, we only have certain doors open in the morning and in the afternoon. We keep the doors locked in all of our buildings. People have to access through certain points. So just so you know that, it's not just a free-for-all where people can come in and out of any door. Back to the Alice drills. As Dr. Price and Mr. Branch told you, what we've done, we've equipped your children and the staff with options. If there is an active intruder, and somebody can get out of the building. That is, as they told you, the number one thing you want to do. The research shows that's your best chance of survival if you can get out of the building. If you cannot get out, the next best thing is to barricade. So this was a question that came up a lot in the questions that were sent to us. So we've looked at a lot of different ways to do this. As Dr. Price said, not all of our doors and all of our schools are the same. Some open out, some open in. Some of the equipment we looked at was rather pricey and a little bit more complicated because maybe if it's metal, it came in one size, but we need different sizes. So the thing that seemed to look the best and work the best is a rope and cleat. Right now, five of our buildings have been equipped with these, and it's really a very simple training that anybody can learn. It's a 30-second video, very simple. So if in an emergency you cannot get out, we are teaching the staff and the students how to barricade themselves in the classroom. The good news is every year this organization called Niche does some research and they are a research-based company and one of the categories they looked at was safety and security. When realtors are trying to sell houses to people they, people are always saying, well, how good is this district? How are they academically? And also, how are they from a safety perspective? So this particular ranking was based on student and parent rankings of health and safety of this school district. They also look at area crime rates, rates for suspensions and expulsions, and school-related arrests. So you can see here how we ranked as of 2017. We come in third of 13 school districts in Bucks County, so we're in the top quintile there. 21st out of 102 in the Philadelphia area puts us in the top uh, quintile. 43rd of 497, top 10% in Pennsylvania. And 370th out of 10,576 in the United States, so top 5%. So overall, what we want to say to you is this is a safe place. It's a great community. People care. People are vigilant. But no place can ever guarantee 100% safety. But we're doing everything we can to make it the best and the safest that it can be. So let's talk about some of the things you haven't heard yet. Some of them on this list you have, so I won't highlight those. When I first arrived here almost five years ago, the district was in the process of finishing securing all vestibule, vestibules in the schools or adding them if they didn't have them. So that is why you have to come in through certain doors and then as we heard earlier, there's the Raptor system. All of our staff members have required trainings they must uh, go to or do online, mandated reporters, suicide prevention and harassment. CPI is how do the staff react if the student is in crisis. We do canine searches. We just had uh, one the other day here at the high school and basically with the help of our police departments, 
We search lockers, we search cars, and we're looking for illegal substances or weapons. That's what these dogs are trained to find. We have assemblies about bullying, and we work very closely with a group called NOVA, Network of Victims Assistance, and they have an upstander mentoring program. We have students from the high school go down to the elementary schools and teach children, how can you stand up if you see someone being bullied? Don't be a bystander, be an upstander. Just looking at this list, what I haven't talked about or anyone else has it, new cameras across the district and on all buses. This is very helpful because in an emergency situation, we can cue into that camera and understand what is going on live. We're working right now is how to give access to our police departments so they can also have live time access to these cameras. We also have a better phone system. The one we had was a bit outdated and that allows us to interface with the uh, public address system in our schools. Since the Parkland situation, we now, as you heard, have part-time security officers in the evening that man the entrances and exits that are open. There's only several of them that we're using right now. And we have uh, increased staff presence in the morning where we have more of the doors open for example here at the high school we have staff members there all these other things on this list you've already heard about so basically there were already things in place we were continuing to put them in and now what we're doing is we're reevaluating and we're looking for best practices but as Dr. Price told you what he heard at that conference and I know what the officers and the chiefs have told us you don't want to be just reactive when something happens. You want to be proactive and you want to think through it carefully because every situation, every campus, every school is different. So with that, I'd like to open this up to any of our police chiefs or legislators or board members, anyone who wants to add anything to this topic. Okay, here's Chief Blake. Good evening. Dr. Radding's right. You, you don't want to knee jerk uh, a decision on a policy that uh, you, know, you might create that down the road you might find out that it's a violation um, or it's just a policy, a bad policy that, that you created. And so you take an incident like this that, that occurred in Florida and you know like any major incident we always meet with the school and we're like this is a great time for you to review your policies. You know, is it, if this occurred here at our school, what's our policy? What's our best practice? Is there something in our policy that is written that we don't follow? Do we need to change that? Do we need to update it? So, you know, the school's always doing an internal look uh, when a situation like this occurs. It's no different than the police department. You know, if we have, uh, for example, a use of force incident, you know, we, we examine our use of force policy and, you know, do we follow uh, our policy? Is, does it need to be updated? Does it need to be rewritten? Did the officer follow that policy? So it's very important in a situation like this that we don't just come off like, uh, you know, thinking, well, we need to arm everybody in the school or we need to supply bulletproof glass for, for the, the whole school. And these might be good ideas, but they might not be the best practice. Um, so, you know, the question that was raised that we should supply or uh, enforce the area with bulletproof glass. Well, Alice, at the current Alice training, teaches that we evacuate. So how are you going to evacuate from a building or a classroom when the glass is shatterproof? You know, that, that's, an, that's something important to think about. Um, you know, the old policy used to be that you would shelter in place. So, you know, Alice comes around and they've seen through studies through the years that started in Beslan and it started uh, in Columbine, you know, they, they took a look at all these school shootings and they, they looked at them and said, how are these people surviving these? Well, they found that that if you resist, and Dr. Price kind of touched base on that, uh, touched base on that, that if you resist, you have a better chance of survival. And he, like he said, it's not so much uh, a resisting where you're confronting the armed subject or the subject that's out of control, it's active resistance. How is that? What's that active resistance look like? That's, that's closing a door, that's locking it, it's barricading it, it's maybe running through the hall and closing a door, it's evacuating. So sheltering in place, 
we're not teaching that anymore. We're, we're teaching to evacuate. We're teaching to actively resist. Um, so I just want to touch. You know, I just want to tell everybody that you know we have to be careful of policies that that we want to create or we want to look at. And you know, sometimes it might seem good to arm everybody. It might seem good to have uh, um, bulletproof glass or or metal detectors, and it might not actually be the best policy. I will tell you this: uh, the the, the uh, uh, communication between our department, Perkinsy, Hilltown, and Benminster, with with Penridge High School staff here is probably endless. Every day, it seems like I'm getting an email from uh, Security Officer Brands or, or Mr. Bono or Dr. Radigan about something, or I'm sending them information. So there is constant communication. So if you're thinking, you know, this uh, incident like this occurs and nothing's being done. We talk about this. We talk, we've talked about this probably in extreme lengths. You know, what does a school shooting look like? What does the offender look like before this incident even occurred? In our roundtable discussions with Dr. Ratting and Dr. Price and, and uh, other officials here uh, bi-monthly, we've talked about that, current trends. Our departments talk about that. I know my guys, when they're at meeting with Perkinsy officers, they're talking about what if an incident occurs at Penrose High School? We know we have a certain time frame to get there. Which door are we going to come in? So it's not something that you know isn't on our minds, and it's probably and, you know it's on your minds because you have students here, and you know you're concerned uh, for safety in the district. So, any questions of me, or I might be able to field a couple. <laughs> I think Dr. Price mentioned that in those tabletop discussions. There we go. I think Dr. Price talked about that through those tabletop discussions. You know, that certainly wasn't a tabletop discussion prior to the shooting in, in Parkland. So now how does that look? How do those students react to that? How, do, how, how can they recognize who the shooter is? I, I can tell you this, that Prior to that, we've had drills in place that mimic that, where a fire alarm was going to be set and we were going to conduct a drill. Obviously, we weren't going to do that after the fact, you know, because of such a traumatic incident. Those are those are things that are discussed, and maybe Alice will look at their their protocol and you know the people that, that govern that and say, okay, maybe we should do this. I, I think this these types of um, protocols and these types of uh, situations are, are fluid. I don't think we can really pinpoint like this. This is what we do in this situation. I, I mean, they're they're all fluid. You know, what happens if a gunman comes in this part of the building that that that's that we can't have access to right away? You know, what's that look like? So well, these for, are these tables. Student, but that's that's something that I'm more concerned about for their minds as opposed to an adult. Right. But for students who lack maybe the experience and have not experienced some more trauma than we have. That, well, the current the current training is to, to evacuate. Um, it's not shelter in place. It's it's to leave the school. And you're right. That situation there kind of prevented that. And that's where we saw a lot of casualties. I do want to add that I, I do appreciate and, and uh, thank you very much for adding character analysis through reading the students' papers. I think that's extremely valuable. I mean, and not to keep defending the school, but I mean, it's not uncommon for my department or, or Perkinsy Burr or Hilltown Township Police Department to get a call from a principal and say, hey, we found this. This is odd to us. 
you know, if something's odd to a student, it's it, call you know, contact the police and, and let us determine if it's odd. I think sometimes we're a little frightened or we don't want to step on anybody's feelings because you know they're different than me and and you know I understand that and I understand everybody's personal space, but if it sends up a red flag, contact the police department, contact your school. So they see things and they'll call us, hey, we saw this on Facebook. You know, security officer branch in the early part of the year. Hey, we're seeing this type of activity on Facebook. Do you know these people? Those those lines of communication that happens. The communication happens here. But I, I back to your original question. I think every incident is is unique. I think these shooters are unique. I think there's a there is a common thread that runs through them. But all these situations are very unique. That's why it's hard to pinpoint that. There's, like a lone wolf. I work in the IT world, um, and uh, a lot of security is defense in depth. And I think to your question, it's the layering that we really have to prepare. And I'd like to see all the aspects that you presented here because it's not one thing that's going to catch and solve a problem. It's the layering and all the layers you put together. It only takes one thing to catch them, to stop them. It's not going to be one uh, smoking you know, bullet. So I think when you look at that situation, proper communication over the PA system and that type of location and awareness would alert someone that somebody's in the building and then the fire alarm goes off, one would be more aware. So I think that's really good to see the progression into that defense in depth type of approach. I have a question on the chief of this year, the administration. So everyone's looking at statistics and, and um, trying to focus on how can we prevent this. And, um, so the vestibules are great. I think that's going to stop a sex offender from getting into school. Um, I'm looking back, and I didn't come prepared for statistics, but um, Sandy Hook, I believe, was someone who was not allowed to be in that school. Other than that, I don't recollect any of the other um, school shootings being that scenario. There were kids that were in that school that were allowed to be there. So where the vestibules are, are protecting the kids from uh, adults entering the school, I don't see how they're protecting um, kids from other kids entering the school with weapons. And I would just like to you know, psychologists can tell kids that, or, or say that the kids wouldn't feel comfortable at school with metal detectors. Are we comparing ourselves to the other top 1% of those uh, numbers that were on the screen earlier? City of Philadelphia, perhaps, you know, and, and the way they do some things. I don't know, good, bad, or indifferent. I know uh, it's not publicized when the last time of an, an inner city school had such an event. A lot of them have metal detectors in, in the type of security force. So I would just like to you know, say that. Well, I, I know from our last sorry about that. I know from our last discussion, our tabletop discussion, uh, the security department was in there with Dr. Price and Dr. Ratty in and uh, Mr. Waffler, and that was the Scott's Melody Packers. And I know, I think, uh, the Officer Branch was tasked with contacting the Philadelphia Police Department. Hey, what's this look like in your school district? You know, how, how do you streamline these students to come in? You know, is it intrusive? So that's been, this, I mean, it has been discussed. Yeah, I, I was gonna add that, that we did contact Philadelphia School District and um, and of Dan was communicating directly, and, uh, and I was a little bit indirectly, and we did look at all of these options. It doesn't mean that things are ruled out completely forever, but it, it's kind of what our you know, reaction, our thoughts are at this moment in time. But um, I, I did want to mention, uh, the gentleman asked about um, the, pulling the fire alarms, and I mean, we'll say just this past fall when we trained new staff, um, this past year we did use that as a scenario, and what would happen if you would be uh, receiving information that there's an intruder uh, maybe on campus and, or maybe you've even locked down already and all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off. Are you leaving like you normally do? Because that's going to be the reaction. Right now whenever students hear the fire alarm, boom, the reaction is we can get out. It could be a fire. But we also know the reality is it's been many, many years since students were harmed in a fire. And so right now we want staff and students to be conscious of everything. So we have talked to our staff about now in that situation, you want to assess it, and you 